Greetings Chemistry students. Um, we are embarking now on module 15. This video will cover the beginning of the module, um, pages 20, 524 to 533. So here we're taking a fresh look at chemical reactions. In our previous modules, we had only looked at reactions simply going from the reactants to the products in a forward direction. However, in this module, we're considering the possibility or the probability that there are a number of reactions that can occur both in a forward direction and in a backward or reverse direction. So what we see in these circumstances is when the reactants here are initially put together, their concentration will be high, and then these start to diminish as the products are formed. Uh, and then in reverse to that, the concentration of the products is initially either zero or very low, and then these would start increasing the more uh, the reaction is completed. Um, as these start to increase, then there's a possibility that they will reform and reverse back to the reactants. And this whole concept is considered the chemical equilibrium. The chemical equilibrium is the point at which both the forward and the reverse reactions in a chemical equation have equal reactant, uh, reaction rates. When it occurs, the amount of each sub substance in the reaction will not continue to change despite the fact that both the reactions still proceed. Now one way to consider this is this chart here, or this graph figure 15.1. So the y-axis here shows the reaction rate and the x is the time in seconds. And our blue line is showing the forward reaction. Uh, that's from the reactants to the products. The red line is showing the reverse reaction. And so we can see that initially the reaction rate is high and then it, it trickles down to the chemical equilibrium. And then the reverse reaction is initially low and increases till it reaches that same state of chemical equilibrium. You can also think of it in terms of the concentration of the reactants. Initially is high, and then as they're used up, they gravitate toward this equilibrium, and the initial concentration of the products is zero or low, and then they increase again until they reach the equilibrium. So, um, one visual explanation of this is the experiment that's outlined 15.1. What they recommended here was to get two two liter uh, soda containers and cut off the tops and put holes in the side at different heights and then add water in and collect the water in these styrofoam cups. But to take the amount that was coming out into this cup and pour it in the opposite bottle and then the water from this cup and pour it in this and then you keep going keep going until finally the conclusion was that they ended up having uh, the same levels of water and so that was meant to be a model of the state of equilibrium that's reached. Um, so looking at this concept quantitatively we can uh, actually work with what's called the equilibrium constant and this is a capital K and this uh, can be explained by first viewing this equation here. It's a generic equation for a chemical reaction. The lowercase a, b, c, and d, d are the stoichiometric coefficients. The uppercase a and b are our reactants and the uppercase C and D are the products. Uh, again, the capital K is equal to the equilibrium constant. And then the way it's put together here is that we would multiply out 
the concentration of the products in the numerator and divide that by that of the reactants in the denominator. And it's modified by looking at these exponents here. The lowercase letters correspond to the stoichiometric coefficients here. So this lowercase c here is the same value that's in front of this capital C, and the lowercase d corresponds to this d, as well as in the reactants. Here you have the lowercase a is the same value as the stoichiometric coefficient, and the lowercase b here. So these brackets, just as in our previous module, they represent concentration. And then the brackets with the EQ after it would represent the concentration of that substance at equilibrium. So let's look at an example on page 530. Uh, we're introduced to this reaction. The nitrogen gas plus the oxygen gas yields uh, nitrogen monoxide. And we're given the, uh, it says the following reaction reaches equi equilibrium when the concentration of N2 is this value, 0.354 molar, and when oxygen is at 0.124 molar, and the NO, the nitrogen monoxide, is 4.51 molar. What's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? So first remember the products are going to go in the numerator. So we have the NO is here, and we see the stoichiometric coefficient of the two here is the exponent level that it's raised to. And then in the denominator of this equation, we have the two reactants. Uh, we see sneakily they both have an uh, invisible one in front of them. So those are both just raised to the first power, and you don't put the one there either. Then we look back at our given information here. So we have the N2 is the 3.54, the uh, O2 is the 1.54, and then the NO is the 4.51. Now, you do have to keep track of units. So since this is squared and this was molar, this would be M squared, and this is just uh, molar and molar. Uh, these end up canceling out because you have m squared up here and then m times m, which is basically m squared on the bottom. So the units on this are actually sort of unitless. It uh, is just 463. And the book points out that the value for k will have a variety of units, just as in the previous module, the lowercase k also had various units associated with it. Okay, so uh, this is the second part of this example, 15.1b. And here it says a chemist is studying this reaction, the NH3 plus O2 plus yields NO2 plus H2O. So it's first providing the concentrations that it starts with. So it says, if the chemist starts with 1.2 molar NH3, 3.4 molar O2, and no NO2 or H2O, he finds the reaction reaches equilibrium when the concentration of NH3 reaches 0.8 molar, of O2 reaches 2.7 molar. At that point, then it says the concentration of the NO2 is 0.4, and H2O is 0.6. What's the equilibrium constant for this reaction? All right, so the take home point on this is that this whole first line of information is extraneous. You really don't need to know this top line in order to calculate your K. You want to focus on the values that are mentioned after it reaches equilibrium. So we first set up the equation um, using this. Uh, uh, chemical equation on the top. So we start with our products. We look at the stoichiometric coefficient. So you have the NO2, and since there's a 4 here, it's raised to the fourth power. You have the 6H2O, so you have the concentration of H2O raised, raised to the sixth power. And then for our denominator, 
you have the NH3 raised to the fourth power because of that four, and the O2 raised to the seventh power because of the seven. Then you go back into your given information and start plugging in the values. So we have NH3s at 0.8, that was coming down here. The O2 is 2.7, that goes in here. And O2 is 0.4, that comes in here. And the H2O is 0.6, and that would be substituted in here. Um, they're all molarity, but we have to keep track of these exponents. The top, if you multiplied m to the fourth times m to the sixth, you're basically just adding these exponents. The top would be m to the tenth. The bottom is four plus seven, the m to the eleventh. So since you have one more on the bottom, eleven minus ten, you'd have one over m. And then these other numbers are just multiplied out on your calculator. So again, they're just pointing out that this unit for k is different than the one that we, um, the unit we had in the previous example. Okay, so uh, now we're going to do a couple on your own. They're very similar. It says, what is the value of the equilibrium constant for this reaction? So we have N2 plus H2 is 2NH3, the ammonia. And then we're given the values at equilibrium here. So first we're going to set up our equation. We have um, K equals the product on top on the numerator. We look at the stoichiometric coefficient. That's going to be our exponent here, the power that it's raised to. Here we have the reactants, the N2 and the H2. Since the 3 is in front of the H2, it's, this will be raised to the third power. Then we go back to our given information and plug in the values that were given. So we have down here for N2, it's 1.21. For H2, it's 0.234. For NH3, it's 1.14. And then you can calculate this value. Keeping track of our units, we have M squared on the top. The bottom would have been M to the first, times m to the third, which is m to the fourth. So if we were subtracting the four minus the two, right, we still have a two on the bottom. So it's one over m squared. Okay, let's look at on your own 15.2. And here we have the chemist studying this reaction. Um, the sulfur trioxide, the SO3, yields the sulfur dioxide plus O2 oxygen gas. Now in this case, they're giving us some information about what it starts with. If the chemist starts with 2.0 molar SO3 and no SO2 or O2, he finds the reaction reaches equilibrium when the following concentrations are reached. So it's SO3 reaches 0.4 molar, SO2 is 2.2 molar, and O2 is 1.1 molar. So similar to our example, this top line is extraneous information. We don't need to know that to calculate our K. We set up the equation, so our products are in the numerator. We look at the stoichiometric coefficients to correspond to our exponent. And then the reactants are going to be in the denominator. And we use this stoichiometric coefficient for um, for its exponent. So then we substitute the values that are given here. The SO3 is 0.4 molar, so that's going in the denominator. The SO2, right, which was here, is going in the numerator. The O2 is going in the numerator. When it all gets calculated out, um, we get 33. In this case, they're using two significant figures, I think because of this initial value that was given. And when we look at our units, right, we have m squared times m to the first. It would have been m to the third on top minus m squared, and that ends up in just molar. All right, so let's move on from there. 
so on page 532, they have a nice summary of some various principles that are correlated with the values of k. Now we remember that the k is calculated by this concentration of the product or products um, divided by that of the reactants. So there's a relationship between these values and the k. So when k is large, the equi equilibrium is weighted toward the product side of the reaction. In other words, that means that the products sort of outweigh the reactants because the, the products are in the numerator. So when they're larger than the reactants, then the products sort of win, so to speak. They're, everything's weighted toward the product side. And in that case, we use the arrow to the right, the forward arrow for the reaction arrow. Now in reverse to this, when the K is small, the equilibrium is weighted toward the reactants. That means that the reactants were larger than the products. And in this case, uh, that would make the K small. And then we use the reverse arrow for the reaction arrow. And then the final scenario might be when K is near one, the equilibrium is balanced between the reactants and the products, right? And then we use this double arrow for the reaction arrow. All right, let's look at on your own 15.3. It says in example 15.1, the equilibrium constants of two equilibrium reactants were calculated for each reaction. Tell whether the equilibrium is weighted toward reactants, weighted toward products, or balanced. So um, just to point out, this is from example 15.1, not on your own 15.1. So in that 15.1a, uh, the first part of it, the k equaled 463. Since this is more or less large, it's sort of relative, but anyway, that the, considering that large, the reaction is weighted toward the product side, whereas in 15.1b, the K was a mere 2.8 times 10 to the minus 6, 1 over molarity. So this, since this is a small value, the reaction is then weighted toward the reactant side of the equation. All right, let's look at on your own 15.4. It says three chemical equilibria, which is the plural of equilibrium, are written below next to each equation. So that's our K values. The value for the equilibrium constant is given. Um, if any of these equations can be written with a single arrow, then do so, making sure the arrow is pointed in the proper direction. So it's starting with the double arrow, and we have the privilege of determining if we can transition to a single arrow. So we look at our first K. It's 4.6 times 10 to the fourth, a relatively large number. So when K is large, we feel that it can be projected toward our product side, and it would be the right, the arrow in the right direction. In this case, the K is 3.2 times 10 to the minus 14th. That's considered quite a small number. So in that case, it's the reverse arrow is the proper arrow. However, the book also says that it's better form instead of writing a reaction with just the reverse arrow, but to rearrange everything so it's actually you take these products and make them the reactants of the equation going from left to right. And then finally, in this reaction, the K is 1.2, which is relatively close to 1, so we can keep the double arrow here in this reaction. All right, so that's it for this section. And in the next section, uh, uh, we'll be covering the next part of our module.